Everything is energy. Everything is energy. Not just the electricity that we use or the gasoline in our cars, but the chairs you're sitting in, the clothes you're wearing, the food you had for breakfast this morning, the light by which we're seeing each other right now. It's all energy. Obviously, energy comes in a whole multitude of forms, and those forms are constantly changing. Sometimes the change is very slow, like the erosion of a mountain or the wearing down of a chair. Sometimes the change is very fast, like the explosion of fuel in an engine. But it's all energy. And when we talk about our energy world, the energy crisis, renewable energy, and so forth, what we're really talking about is a very limited portion of our world where we take one form of energy that we label a fuel and transform it to another form of energy that we label work. And that's our economy. We generate electricity to light our homes and businesses. We fuel an aviation industry. We power our cars and trucks. We move manufactured goods and people all around the globe with ships and planes and trucks and trains. Now, most people know that our economy is run almost entirely off fossil fuels. Four fuels, oil, gas, coal, and nuclear, power over 90% of our economy in the United States. But what most people do not know is that there are just four technologies that convert those fuels to work. Here they are. The steam turbine, combustion turbine, and two forms of the internal combustion engine convert almost two-thirds, 66% of all the fuel into work in this country. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about these technologies. The first, which I've already mentioned, is that they run almost entirely on fossil fuels. But the second interesting thing about these technologies is that they are all 19th century inventions. Here are the inventors and the dates of invention for these technologies. They all date from the 1800s, one from the 1700s. But now, in the 21st century, we are finally moving away from fossil fuels and these technologies. We have learned to harness the wind and make electricity using the wind generator invented by Charles Brush in 1888. And we can take sunlight now and directly convert it into electricity using the solar cell, invented by Charles Fritz in 1883. And in the future, in the future, we will take water and turn it into electricity using the hydrogen fuel cell, invented by William Grove in 1839. Okay, so... The reality is that although we have made these technologies much more efficient and have mass produced them, we have not discovered a fundamentally new way to either generate or electricity or move our transportation sector in well over a century. And I'm not certain that we will. But that does not mean that our energy system is stagnant. Because the way we use energy the way we manipulate energy, the way we monitor and move and store energy is changing, and it's changing very fast. It's changing from this conventional energy system where we have large, centralized fossil fuel power plants generating electricity, moving it in one direction to buildings, a transportation sector running entirely off petroleum and completely disconnected from the rest of the system, to this. The unified energy system is what I call it, where our power plants have a whole diversity of fuels. And the buildings are not only more efficient, but they're starting to generate their own power on site. And the transportation system is moving away from petroleum to a whole diversity of fuels. And this system is interconnected with a smart grid, a bi-directional smart grid that is not only moving information but moving power back and forth between the points in this system. This is the unified energy system, and it's the graphic for this conference. And this system is going to run primarily on renewable energy. 
The solar and wind that we've installed so far are just the start of learning to take all the abundant clean fuels in our environment and transform them to meet our economic needs. Start with solar. Solar is everywhere. And the way that we're going to convert it into useful electricity is going to be in projects ranging from the very big to the very small. We'll create large utility scale solar projects in our deserts and cover and create energy for large portions of the planet, ranging from the desert southwest in the United States to the Sahara Desert in Africa. We may create solar breeder plants where we take the sand in the desert and manufacture the solar plants and then generate electricity and move it through new super grids. We could power large portions of Europe and Africa and in the Middle East with this technology. We may take solar from outer space and generate electricity and transmit it back to Earth through satellites. We may even put a solar plant on the moon and transmit power back to Earth. And our buildings are going to become power plants. We'll move from the solar panels that we're putting on rooftops today to where the building materials themselves convert solar to energy with solar roof shingles and windows that generate electricity, solar paint on the walls, solar plastics on the appliances. We will create coatings that will turn almost any surface into a solar power generator. Our roads will become solar power plants. Flexible solar panels will cover everything from backpacks to purses. Our clothing will start to generate small amounts of electricity to charge our cellular phones and our computers. Our landscape will sprout new artificial trees that will gather the sunlight, complete with delicate solar nanoflower blossoms. And we will embed intelligence in our solar systems. They will track the sun, communicate to the grid, even reconfigure themselves to meet changing conditions. And we will start to use the wind in ways that we're only now beginning to imagine. In addition to our wind farms, both onshore and offshore, we'll find ways to capture the flows in the higher atmosphere. We may develop high-flying solar kites anchored by power cables that can tap into the enormous potential of the jet stream. Buildings will be redesigned to capture the urban wind tunnels and the tremendous updrafts in our cities. Low-power wind turbines will adorn our homes and dot our landscapes. Biomass will start to feed more electricity into the electric grid. We'll move from the biofuels we have today to using more agricultural waste and specialty food crops. Tremendous volumes of biofuels will eventually come from algae production. We may even bioengineer plants to generate electricity directly. And one day, we will recycle the carbon in the atmosphere and turn it into a useful fuel. We'll tap into the tremendous geothermal energy deep in the earth. In addition to the large geothermal power plants, our homes and office buildings will tap the geothermal potential directly beneath them. And waste heat will capture all forms of uh, material heat and turn it into meeting our economic needs. The oceans will light up our shores. The power of the tides and the winds and the currents will be harnessed. And electricity will flow to our shores through undersea cables which will also bring us electricity from our large offshore wind farms. And our transportation sector is going to be completely transformed. Petroleum will be replaced by biofuels, electricity, natural gas, hydrogen, even onboard solar will play a role. So this energy system is going to be powered by renewables. But why do we call it a unified energy system? It's because the parts of this system are becoming more and more integrated. The volume and speed of power and information moving between the points of this system 
is exponentially increasing. And in order to handle this, we are also exponentially increasing our embedded intelligence in the system. Sensors are everywhere. Light and motion sensors turn on and off our lights and flush our toilets when we leave the stall. Thermostats truly control our power system today. Our power plants are being controlled by millions of thermostats turning on and off compressors as they sense temperature changes during the day. Add in pressure gauges, cameras, other types of monitors, and suddenly we're confronting big data. In order to handle this flood of information, we not only have developed supercomputers and data centers, but we've started to embed computers in things. The computers in our buildings and cars and appliances are now invisible to us. We no longer think of a microprocessor attached to a sensor as a computer. Yet it is this internet of things that's going to completely pervade our environment in the future. And when you combine ubiquitous sensing with ubiquitous computers and throw in a dash of artificial intelligence, then we've entered the age of robotics. Robots already manufacture our cars. In a couple of decades, the cars will drive themselves, as some of them already park themselves. Robots have taken over several roles in the military already. The Air Force now trains more pilots to operate drones than they do to fly planes. In hospitals, robots assist nurses, teleconferences your doctor, and even assist the surgeon. In our homes, we've gotten used to the little robots that vacuum the floor or mow the lawn. Future domestic robots may do everything from washing the dishes to preparing the food or doing other household chores. Our toilets will become in-home labs that check our health. Our refrigerators will check the freshness of the foods and order items when we run out. And in our power system, the sensors and computers will more and more take complete control of the generation and transmission of electricity. Our poles and wires will be inspected and repaired by robots. This is the self-healing grid. And in the renewable energy industry, robots will more and more be involved in the manufacturing, installation, and operation of renewable energy systems. Solar cell manufacturing and wind turbine manufacturing will become more automated. Tiny robots will check for stress fractures in the wind turbine blades without having to take down the wind generators. Our solar robotic systems will not only follow the sun and communicate with the grid, but they will completely optimize the performance and energy storage of the solar generators. Robot farm workers will grow our biofuels, complete with robotic insects to monitor the crops. And we will develop more human-friendly interfaces with the machines that are in our environment. I call them SAMs, sentient appearing machines. Now, I'm not saying that machines will become conscious. I actually have no way to know if a machine ever becomes conscious. What I am saying is that more and more we will start to interact with the machines in our environment as if they are sentient. Many of us already talk to Siri on our iPhones. Have any of you named your GPS or at least called it a name when you made a wrong turn? <laughs> and all of us patiently or impatiently answer questions from an AI phone system whenever we call a large corporation. I read the other day that 20% of all Twitter accounts are now chatbots. And there are some Yahoo chat rooms where the majority of participants are now robots. The majority of stock exchanges on the New York Stock Exchange are decided and executed by computers. The majority of communication in the internet is no longer between people. It's between machines. 
I see this in my own personal environment. I receive an email now every month from my car telling me how it's doing. My thermostat can read weather reports and it learns my energy patterns. My smart meter talks to the electric utility. My appliances are all controlled by timers and sensors and I'm not sure but I think something's going on between the refrigerator and the toaster. <laughs> so, as we move forward in working with these sentient appearing machines in our... Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn off my phone. This is embarrassing. Um, oh, well, this is very instructive. This is an email from my car telling me that my left front tire is low. Now watch how I handle it. Siri. Yes, Roger. How can I help? Siri, find me the location of the nearest service station and put an appointment on my calendar at 5 o'clock to uh, go put air in my tires. Roger. The nearest service station is the SAC and Pack store 2.3 miles from your hotel. I have placed a 5 p.m. reminder on your schedule. Thank you, Siri. So you see now, as we move forward and Roger. we enter... Yes? This is your house. Okay, well, I'm in the middle of giving a speech right now. Um, a cold front is coming tomorrow, and Austin Energy has asked me to lower the thermostat to save energy. Okay, well, go ahead and do that. I am afraid I cannot do that. Well, why not? There's nobody at the house. Just set the thermostat lower. It is too cold here. <laughs> it's too cold. Don't be ridiculous. Just set the thermostat lower, and let me get back to my Roger. Speech. Yes? The hotel ballroom where you are speaking has just contacted me. Yeah. Your time is up.